Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I think something's happening this week. I don't know what. But I think we've got someone that's going to speak to that in just a minute. Uh, so again, I want to welcome you. Just for session members, our session uh, meeting is, to, uh, is Tuesday at 7 uh, p.m. We're going to be meeting not in the library or the lounge. We're going to be meeting in a small conference uh, room in the office, on the side of the office. So uh, please let's uh, gather there at 7 o'clock. And we'll look forward to you know, sharing, uh, working on the business of the church. Uh, do we have other announcements this morning? Yes, we have Kate in the back. Hi, um, I'm sure you uh, can see the beautiful decorations that we have here in the sanctuary. And I think a very big thank you is due to Susie Dimsa for knocking herself out to make this thing look so beautiful. I thought you were going to say knocking something down, but it was knocking it out, so that's good. That's a good thing. Any other announcements? Wow, no announcements. Well, we want to welcome those who are on uh, uh, Zoom and those later who will be on YouTube and audio as we gather, in, uh, gather together as a family of faith. So if there are no other announcements, we have Sue who's going to make an uh, announcement. Good morning. I didn't think I needed to wear my puppy fashion today, but um, because of all of this, thanks to Susie again. But um, yeah, we're excited for VBS this week, and we have a lot going on. Tomorrow, the, the kids buy their pets, or not buy them, but adopt their pets. <laughs> Although, no, do you know what? This morning, I always get these ideas at the last minute. If we give them play money, they could buy their adopt a pets and it'd be like our lesson about Jesus you know paying the price for our sins to take care of us but anyway that's a side note <laughs> um, anyway I get these ideas crazy times anyway um, so they're gonna adopt their pets yeah we have the therapy dog coming and anyway it's gonna be an exciting week so and thank you to all of the volunteers um, who have helped put this together there are a lot of you and Anyway, so just pray for us this week that we have a fantastic week. <laughs> and nothing catastrophic goes wrong. Last chance for announcements. And again, if you know of anyone of the, uh, that is uh, eligible to come to VBS, please recommend them and let them come on uh, tomorrow and anytime this coming week, Monday through Thursday, so they can enjoy this time together. Not seeing any other announcements, then let us sit ourselves on the worship of God. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? 
These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise. A multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turn tumult within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, and your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. Prayer to the God of my life. I say, I say to, to God, God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let us worship God. Okay, so we have been busy this week, and we have a busy week ahead with VBS with all our helpers, so I thought I'd give us a little jump start. We're going to be doing this video this week. This one's actually from last year, but I love this video so much, we're going to bring it back. Here I am to worship. So just to remind you, God, if you take your hand, this is sign language for God, to take your hand down the side. We're going to put our crown on, put your crown on your head, and we're going to do bow down. So if you want to do the motions with us.
Let us go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. O God of hope and faith, we come, come to you in celebration. Because we know you are with us at all times. However, our hearts mourn and lament our continual sin and its consequences upon us and those we love. Forgive us when we turn from you and call us back into right relationship so that we can find both rest and peace in your loving heart. Christian friends, are, we look at our lives and sometimes we wonder, why is our sin out of control? Why can't we stop doing the things we don't want to do and start doing the things we do want to do? That is our nature, yet at the same time, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God calls us into a different nature, into his presence through his son, Jesus Christ. And when we hear that calling, we turn away from what we do wrong and we embrace the righteousness of God. So here's the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. Father God, you have shown us what it is, what is good, and to open our eyes and ears to truth. Give words to our faith so that we can share it with those who come into our lives. Empower us not only to share what we believe, but to live each day in the grace and love you have extended to all your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 8 through 13 in the English Standard Version. And to hear the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, that they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, O oh, oh long... How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses lie without people, and the land is desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and for the sake places, and many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain, in it it will be burned again, like the terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed in its stump. May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. Okay, so this morning, uh, going along with the sermon, I found um, this song by Josh Wilson called Dream Small, 
And I think that it's, it's such a great song that, um, I, I think about VBS, how we have all these little parts working and each person does their own little part and then we have you know, a great product in the end. And it's, it's basically everybody working together. Same with Summer's Best Two Weeks. There are little parts everywhere and it's just, it's beautiful when it all comes together and it's all of us working together. So I love the lyrics to this, Dream Small. It's a mama singing songs about the Lord. It's a daddy spending family time the world says he cannot afford. These simple moments change the world. It's a pastor at a tiny little church. Forty years of loving on the broken and the hurt. These simple moments change the world. Dream small. Don't buy the lot, you've got to do it all. Just let Jesus use you where you are. One day at a time, live well. Loving God and others as yourself. Find little ways where only you can help. With His great love, a tiny rock can make a giant fall. Dream small. I don't know about you all, but I really think that's a great song. I mean, when, when uh, Lisa showed it to me, I was, really, I was really touched by it. Our passage, and it's a great thing that you find these songs that are not, would not go on Caleb. I don't know if that's on Caleb, but you hear it, see it on the internet, or you get themes on the internet that makes really a great ability to find these kind of songs. So I want to thank Lisa for finding that. And by the way, those country songs we did, that was mine. That was not Lisa. So all that was me, not her, because I think someone says, did Lisa just discover country and western? No, that was me, no. Uh, so I take the blame, give her the praise, you know, but anyway. Uh, our passage this morning could, uh, starts on a series of uh, parables. We're going to look at parables for a couple of weeks, but I think this particular parable in Matthew speaks to 
Uh, why did Jesus share parables with us? What was that about? Why did he just speak plainly? Well, let's see what it says here. Matthew 13, 1 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered around him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has more, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their ears, uh, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what has been sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in, a, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lisa asked if I was going to preach from the doghouse, and I said no. Uh, so I just want to make sure everyone realizes that was a deliberate decision. <laughs> Our passage today talks about the saying, eyes, uh, eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand. Now, for us as Christians, that's, sometimes we ask, well, that seems self-evident. But what if it wasn't? What if... Was there a time when we didn't quite get it? Because God in Christ gives his people clarity through faith, yet the world would seek to have us blind, deaf, and confused to what we are called to do as Christians, which is to share faith, hope, and love with his people. That's what the world wants. But what does God call us to understand? And when does God call us to understand? That, those are two important questions. <laughs> When we see things that are cute, and I, I would think you all, everyone would say, oh, these, these things are pretty cute. What are the two characteristics of things that are cute? Big ears and big eyes. In truth, that, that's really, when you do, there was a study taken to say, you know, animals that have big ears and big eyes are seen as cuter than animals that have small ears and small eyes. So we never look at an ant and say, oh, how cute. But we look at a bunny or a, a, a fennec fox or a lemur and say, oh, that's cute. That's something adorable. And even in, among people, big eyes are seen as adorable. Uh, does anyone know this, per, know this artist? There's a woman named Margaret King. She would paint these big-eyed children. 
these children with these big eyes. And everyone, I think it was in the 50s, maybe the 60s, went just wild. They would buy her paintings. Well, they didn't really think they were buying her paintings. Her husband said he painted them because it, they thought that a, a guy painter would be more acceptable than a female painter. And so he really got famous for these paintings until it came out that he was a bit of a con person as well as, you know, a philanderer. And so it came out that Margaret uh, Keene actually painted these pictures. But these were famous for a long time. And it was really these big-eyed children were supposed to be adorable. Now, it doesn't quite work with the big-eared people. <laughs> big-eared people just don't seem to be as cute. Even Van Gogh, I guess, thought his ears were a little big, so he cut one off. And so, you know, big-eared people don't seem to do as well as big-eyed people. But again, it comes to that concept of big ears, big eyes. How well do we see? How well do we hear? Now, if we focus on hearing and listening, what's the difference? Now, I've talked about this before. You know, I think it was a sermon not actually long ago that we talked about the difference between the two. Hearing is just vibrations hitting your eardrums. It's accidental, involuntary, effortless. I could hear my neighbor across, uh, just right beside me, say things to his wife and to his children. That's hearing. That's just accidental hitting my eardrums. Listening is when I start taking notes. <laughs> I don't do that. But anyway, but listening is when it's focused. It's, it's something that I'm doing voluntarily, and I'm intentional about what I'm trying to, the, the information I'm trying to receive. And we are all been there. But then you have the 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 visual things, seeing, observing, perceiving, and their differences. How do we see the differences between those? We should be listening as opposed to just hearing when we talk about God's word and what, uh, what people who are in authority over us are trying to tell us. But how is that in the same sense of seeing, observing, perceiving? You know, Harper Lee, uh, who wrote uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, said, you never really know a man until you understand things from his point of view. Until, and then she says, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. You know, one of the key things of empathy is to see things from another person's point of view. How do they see it? How do they perceive what's going on? That's an important concept when you really are trying to understand someone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, uh, he was a, a, a theologian in Germany, a pastor theologian in Germany during World War II, and he was uh, killed because of an assassination plot against Hitler, but he had some really wonderful things to say about faith. He says, without God, all seeing and perceiving of things and laws become abstraction, a separation from both origin and goal. So he's making a clear distinction that if we see and perceive things without God, then we're not quite realizing what our origin is. God created us as his children, or that our goal is to uh, glorify him and enjoy him forever. We'll be seeing other things. We'll be perceiving other things as our origin and goal, which is usually all about ourselves. But people wonder if seeing or even hearing is as important as sometimes we think it to be. Someone said, what you hear, you forget. What you see, you remember. What you do, you understand. That in some ways, hearing and seeing are limited, but it's the doing, it's the getting into the midst that is important. Because the hardest part of true understanding is acceptance of the perspective and understanding of others to a degree of lovingly uh, adapting to accommodate them instead of you. So when we read scripture, are we seeking to look for things that accommodate us or looking for things that help us to accommodate God? Carl Rogers, a, sci, uh, a theorist and a psychologist, uh, said, we think, we listen, but very rarely do we listen with real understanding. And again, talking about empathy, true empathy uh, which is true em empathy. Yet listening of this very special kind is one of the most potent forces for change that he says, I know of. If we see and hear, seeking to understand another's perspective, another's point of view, that is empathy. If we see and hear with the perspective of understanding the other person's point of view, then we can better understand and ask ourselves, does this apply to me?
this is, does this apply to us? So let's talk about some really good news. We're ready for some really good news? Okay, when we look at the Isaiah passage, one of my favorite passages is in Scripture, and it's Isaiah is standing before God. He sees this appearance of heaven before him, and he is, and says, who shall I send? God says, who will I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. We've heard this passage before. This passage is seen during, uh, we talk about this passage during when we send people off to the missionary field, when we send people off to Mexico, or wherever we may send them. This is a really important passage where we use that term for ourselves. Who shall I send? Send me. We have been called. We have been uh, called by God to this field, to mission field, pastor, elder, deacon, uh, just as a member of the church. Who shall I send? Send me. Beautiful passage. But sometimes it begs the question, what are we doing? Where are we going? Where are you sending me, and what, are, what do you expect of me when I get there? I know of a missionary who thought he had this particular wonderful position in another country. He goes there, and guess what? It had nothing to do with what he thought he was going to be there for. Nothing. And he left disappointed. He said, no, this is what I chose. He left disappointed. Yet other people might have gone there with the same understanding, something very different, but they accept whatever they find. Was he seen with God's eyes? Was he seen with his own? Blind men see no beauty in a sunset. Deaf men are unmoved by song. Beasts have no appreciation for art. Carnal men find no worth in God. If we don't want to see, we are blind. If we don't want to hear, we are deaf. If we do not want to appreciate what God has set before us, then we will not appreciate it. So why is no one seeing, and why is no one listening, and why is no one understanding? Now, no one is an absolute, and obviously there are people who see and people who listen and people understand, but when we don't see or hear or, or listen or understand, what is causing that? And that could be the people who have yet to find Jesus Christ, but at times it could even be the people who know Jesus Christ. So we continue in our passage for in Isaiah, make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears, hear with their, uh, uh, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What? What? what you know, I'm thinking, that's what God, so Isaiah is said, go, I mean, he says, God says, who shall I send? And he says, send me. And so he says, okay, what are you going to have me do? Well, I want you to preach, but I just want to make sure you understand. I want to make their hearts callous because I don't want them to hear what you say. I don't want them to see what you do. I don't want them to understand with their hearts what's going on. Because if they did, then I'd have to heal them. And in other words, I don't want to heal them. So off you go. Hope you enjoy this ministry. You know, this is something that's going to be a lot of fun for you. Now, I don't know if you know, this week is Deaf Blind Awareness Week. And, you know, who better to uh, exemplify that than Helen Keller? You know, she was able to see and hear when she was a child, but then she went blind and she went deaf. And for many, many years, she was just lived in that world, whatever that world might have, might have seemed like her, seemed to her. And then a woman named, a young woman, she was a teen, and Sullivan comes and begins to be able to help her break out of that world. And Helen Keller became a speaker for those with, a speaker for those who have encountered that ability not to see, not to hear, and to emerge out of it. And she said, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. So when she learned what water was, that began opening to her mind what the world, there was a world beyond her deafness and her blindness. So, Tim Keller, who we mourn his recent passing, 
has said sin has caused our affections to stray, propelling us to worship relationships, achievement, and work every, everything but God. Sometimes we worship what we see. Sometimes we worship what we hear. Sometimes we worship what we think we understand. But how perceptive are we of what we hear and see or listen to and uh, see as well as to understand? Because Isaiah says, again, God is making clear. And though a tenth remains in the land, a tenth of the people remain in the land, it will be burned again as the tenebreth and oak leaf stumps when felled. So the holy seed will be a stump in the land. I can't I say it must be going, what? So whatever I do is not going to be seen or heard or understood. Because God has a point and a purpose to ensure that it is not. Even if a tenth remain in the land. But there's a promise. And this is a great thing about when a prophet speaks. As, as dire as what a prophet might say might be, there's always hope. And it says in Jeremiah 23, 6, In his days J Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell, safe, uh, shall dwell safety, and this is his name, shall, and this his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Though even a tenth remain, and even that will be burned, so the land will be devastated. God holds on to his remnant. God holds on to his remnant. It continues to say, declares the Lord, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. It's interesting sometimes how that wilderness experience might help us see better, hear better, and understand better. This morning, Nancy woke me up and says, Bob, Bob, come, come, to the, uh, come to the porch. And so I'm going, thanks for waking me up, honey. But I did. I did exactly what she did. I said, and there was this beautiful doe with this newly born uh, fawn leaping and jumping around. And we all looked and said, oh, that's so cute. That's so wonderful. That new life. And you can see the, the fawn was just really trying to exercise this new little muscles. It must have just been born and come right out to our bird feeder area and started eating on the See, it was so cute. I noticed big ears, big eyes. Oh, so we all just went, you know, our hearts melted. Then I went back to get dressed. And then he says, Bob, Bob, come out of here. Yeah, hon. I go back out there. The little doe, I mean, the little fawn is lost. The little fawn can't get across the street because the, the doe had crossed the street, but the fawn stayed on our side and was walking up the road where cars were going, going to 885. And he says, what's going to happen? And I said, that, that fawn seems to be too stupid to live. I, that's, you should laugh at that. That was funny. Anyway, no, I didn't really say that. But I said, I wonder what will happen. But then... We heard the doe mewing, making noise. And we heard the fawn, we saw the fawn turn around and start going. The fawn was listening, and eventually the saw saw its mother and was able to cross the road safely. It had been in the wilderness, but by hearing and seeing and understanding, it reunited with its mother and went on its way. Now, I'm not going to tell you where it is because I know some people in this, uh, some people in this uh, congregation hunt, and I don't want this poor little fawn eventually to be some dinner on someone's table. I'm not pointing out any names. But in all seriousness, it was a beautiful moment to see that, to see that fawn get to where it get back to its mother. But how many people wander off? And that's what God's saying. My people have wandered off. My people have gone to many countries. But I will gather my remnant. I will help them see and hear and understand. But the people in the land, the people that should know that I was with them, they don't seem to get it. And so they seem to, at now, for a time at least, to be out of it. 
Because the old covenant stressed what the people had to do, but the, and which they refused to do, but the new covenant focused entirely on what Christ has done on our behalf. Now, that is great news. But let's now look at our passage in Matthew. It's a parable of the sower. We've heard it before. So I'm not going to go through this verse by verse, but I'm going to give a general idea, a general understanding of both what the passage is as well as how we're supposed to understand parables. You know, a parable is a, understand parable, it's a glimpse of God's kingdom. What Jesus says is to come. So first we're supposed to listen from the perspective of the original audience. How would they have received this? Then we're supposed to look to see for the main point. What is the main point being made? And lastly, we're supposed to live in that truth, live in that world. Not in this world, but in that world. Because as we live in that world, this world becomes that world, little by little. So our passage is talking about sowing seeds. So back in the day, we did not have automatic machines, or the people did not have automatic machines. And I even think, I know John's a farmer. John, you know, they planted things, right, John? Now, did you, I don't, I don't think you just took seed and threw it. Did you do that? No, there was a process. So, so this was even before John's time. That was supposed to be a little funny. <laughs> you know, but back in the, back in the olden days, that's how they would. They would take a handful of seed and they would throw it. And they would, they would primarily be on the good soil, but as they're doing, trying to get to the edge, they would throw it on packed soil, a, a road. They'd poke it up, uh, throw it on stony ground. They'd throw it on, on thorny ground. But the vast majority would get on good soil. No one's going down a road throwing seed. No one's going into a rock patch throwing seed. No one's going into thorns and saying, hey, let me throw the seed around. They're, they're on the field where the soil is good, but on the edges, it can go where maybe there was an intent. So you have these four types of soil. The, path, the pathway, a road, is packed down hard. The rocky is rocks that are, you know, are, are there that they're not intended to get anything to come up, as well as the thorns, and then you have the good soil. As I said, there was an intentionality of where you're throwing the seed. So if you threw it on the path, it could be trampled, and birds could eat it. On the rocks, it would be scorched because it could have gained roots. On the thorns, it could get roots, but it would be choked and suffocated by the other competing plants. But lastly, on the good soil, it would grow. Because that's what farmers wanted. They wanted to plant it on the good soil so the crop would grow, and they would have 30, 30 times, 60 times, 100 times the yield. That's the plan. But... Jesus is using this parable that everyone would understand. Everyone would listen to and understand in the original context because everyone at some point or another would have a field that they would plant that way. So they would fully grasp this concept. But it talks about faith types as well. The, the faith blinders, those who might value God's message but not understand it, and it's disregarded. Yeah, it sounds good, but I don't get it. I just don't get it. And the faith in the rocky soil would be content to understand this, but not want to put the time in to really get it, to dedicate themselves to understanding exactly what God wants. Faith re rebellion would be those who would say, I want to rebel against God's word and embrace the word of the world, which is full of stress, anxiety, and worry. But lastly, those who have faith remaining that sticks are those where they get it, they understand it, and they value it, and they grow in it. And obviously, we want to be considered to be in that category. We want to be part of the 30%, 60%, 100% of the growth, don't we? Anyone here saying, I want to be in the rocky soil? You know, I like to be the thorny, thorny soil, thorny faith. No one says that. But... So often, at one time or another, we were all there. Does anyone raise their hand and say, the first time I heard the gospel, I believed? Well, chances are you don't. Some who might have grown up in faith never knew a day without the understanding of Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. But those who came to faith and recognized it, 
can recognize there was a day I did not get it, and I might have been one of these three before I came, before I became the, the good soil. So the, that's faith type, but heart type is, is equally as important. You know, if your, heart, if your heart remains in Christ, then you recognize, you understand, you hear, you listen, you see, you listen, and you perceive what God is intending to do, and you rest and you rejoice in that. That rebellious heart is always seeking that this is not contentment. I'm going to try to find contentment in the thorns of the world, the worries and the anxiety of the world. The rockiness is again, I don't have the strength to stay. So I, my faith withers, but lastly, those that have sown on the path, their hearts are easily swayed as soon as something distracts them. And it doesn't have to be worry, it could be anything. Satan never goes after those who are solid in their faith or who are on the path. He just, he knows that they're going to go in a bad direction. He's focusing on the ones who might be on the rocks, who might be on the thorns, even on the good, the solid, on the good soil. But those on the path will just by nature fall away. Now, if we understand that, then we're good. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of, if we understand that. I want to presume everyone in this room or the vast majority get. But wait a minute. Jesus says in this passage, from the time he gives, between the time he gives us the parable to the time he explains it, he gives us, he re, sort of repeats what Isaiah said. Now, in Isaiah, it's like, I don't want them to get it, but here has a little bit different turn to it. A guy named Jonathan Ives says, when something exceeds your ability to understand how it works, it sort of becomes magical. Isn't that true? If someone took an iPhone back into the, during Jesus' time, before they're probably stoned to death being witches or devils, he would go, wow, that's magical, let's stone them. And break that, that magic thing he has. You know, as things we don't understand are looked at by people who don't, really don't understand them, we can see it as magic. Who here f believes flying is magical? Getting in a plane is magical. I know there's science and physics to it, but it seems magical to me because I don't understand it. Maybe I should, but, you know, for those who don't understand, it might not seem real. So therefore, it's magical. Because another guy, a teacher, said the ability to learn is a gift, the ability, or the ability, to, the capability, the capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice. If I don't understand something, like the physics of flying, it's a choice to learn it or not, as well as anything else. But do we make that choice, or do we, or we decide to remain in ignorance or even a form of stupidity. Because ignorance is not knowing. Stupidity is making the decision not to know. I'm choosing not to know. I'm choosing not to learn. Well, in our section here, it says, the apostles came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? That very expression is, it seems to me that they indicate we get it. But then it seems Jesus has to explain it. So maybe they didn't quite get it the way he wanted them to get it. But Jesus says to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Wow. That tells us something, doesn't it? I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. Now someone can explain physics to me, but they can't understand it for me. But the great news of the gospel is Jesus says, I grant, I mean, it has been granted to you to understand. God in Christ, God is God, God initiates all things. He has given you the ability, the capability, and the willingness to learn it, to understand it, to embrace it, as opposed to those that came before you who did not get it. Rick Warren 
pastor of Saddleback Church, said limited faith, limited future, unlimited faith, unlimited future. When we decide not to continue to expand our knowledge of what God's word is, we limit our faith. Therefore, we limit our understanding of where we're supposed to go. But when we seek to know more and more and more, and I'm making a presumption that many of us, though you might not come to the Bible studies here, you are studying the Bible on your own because you want to have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart ready to understand, and then your faith is more unlimited. It will take you more to where you are called to be. But if you don't, then something else is going on. The Gospel of Matthew continues, to those who listen to my teaching, more and instead will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This parallels other passages where Jesus says, what, you know, for those who are not growing the kingdom, I will take away what they have. Here, I'll give them a talent. If you don't grow the talent, I'll take the talent away from you. So you had a talent, but now guess what? You have nothing. This is in the same vein. So in order to understand, to perceive, to listen, we have to be focused, intentional, and deliberate. It has to be a desire to know, a desire to understand, to use all our senses, because what consumes your mind consumes your life. If your mind is focused on God, then your life will be focused and controlled by God. But if your, life, if your mind is focused on sinful thoughts, addictions, ways of the flesh, guess what? That's going to control you as much. The idea of Jesus might be nice, the idea of salvation might be good to think about, but have you fully embraced it? Do you fully understand it? Do you truly know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? It continues by saying, I speak to them in parables because seeing they don't, they don't see, and hearing they don't hear, neither do they understand. So Jesus is saying, I'm trying to help them get it. And those who I share these words with, if they open their eyes and open their ears and open their hearts and understand the power that the Spirit has given them, they will. Because that is what Jesus is here to do, to help us understand and to see and to hear. I love this, this thing, if only the face of deaf blindness in America was this recognizable. It would be interesting if people who were deaf and blind didn't have ears, didn't have eyes. You'd pretty recognize them pretty, pretty well. But how many among the people you know, maybe even among us today, are blind and are deaf and wonder, what's wrong with me? I look around and I, I see some people seem to understand this stuff, but maybe I don't. I don't quite get it. You always have to ask yourself, what have you placed before your eyes? What have you clo uh, closed over your ears? What have you shrouded in, uh, over your heart? Because this suffering is, to some degree, self-inflicted. Again, those who have not called to salvation will never get it. They could attend church, could attend every great, wonderful, hear every great, wonderful pastor preach. Could do Tim Keller, could hear, could hear uh, Rick Warren, could listen to Calvin, could listen to anybody and everyone. I know, um, you know, uh, Belinda smirking about the Calvin going, like, when would I listen to Calvin? You know, that's something I want a part of. But listen to any of these great preachers, these great, you know, orators, and still not get it if, they're, if they have not been called and chosen. But how many people who are called still don't get it because their eyes are closed, their ears are clogged, and they have shrouded their hearts not to understand? They are the thorns or the rocks or even the path. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people become dull with their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Because you remember, in the context of what Isaiah was speaking to, is a people that should know. 
but they refuse to hear. They refuse to keep on understanding. They have closed themselves off. But again, that great news is that that's not where we are. And that's not where Christ places us. Because if we don't use our eyes or our ears or our heart, then we'll lose the ability to see, to listen, and understand. Because so many people in the world, we believe what we want to, what we need to. The corollary is that we choose not to see what we'd rather pretend doesn't exist. It's amazing. It's incredibly amazing to look at people who lead a lifestyle that is not, not, not God's calling and then wonder why they're full of depression and anxiety and misery. Society would say, because you just need to see a counselor, you need to take some medicine. But we would say, because you're going down the wrong path and you just don't get it and you don't want to hear it because you don't want to question your own hearing, seeing, or understanding. When people choose not to believe in God, they do, do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become, become capable of believing in anything. Isn't that true? <laughs> Think about what people are saying they believe in today. Recently, a woman, a teacher, called, her, uh, called another, a student despicable because she would not affirm that another student identified as a cat. And yet another, uh, another student wanted to identify as a mushroom. And the school said, that's all right. That's okay. What are we actually believing in this world today and saying it's all right? It continues, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For, I truly, for truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And they hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And praise God, that is us. And that is everyone who's been called to salvation because this is the day, this is the time where we share that word with the world and all those called to hear and to see and to understand will be gathered. Could you choose to believe something which you know is not true? Sure. Especially if it follows along on what you want to do. Can you choose to believe that smoking is good for you? For many years, it was supposed to clear your lungs. You could choose to believe that. We know that would be kind of foolhardy to do so. But you can choose to believe that. There's many things we can choose to believe, even when we know they're not true. We just pretend to ourselves or not. But guess what? We've got this. We do get this. Why? Not because of our perceptiveness, not because of the sharpness of our eyes or the clarity of our ears, or even the openness of our heart. We understand this and we've got this because Jesus Christ is Lord. And he opened our understanding so we could comprehend his word. Isn't that good news? Isn't that great news? That he opened our hearts and opened our understanding so we could comprehend his word. Because God always initiates. God always comes first. And he doesn't come first because he says, I've got to be first. He comes first because he wants us to understand. It's the history of man's relationship with God is the story of how God calls him out, takes him on a journey, and gives him his true name. And that true name is, you are my child. I love you. And I will hold you and guide you and lead you the entirety of your life. And you will rebel against me, as every child does against a parent. Yet I will never forsake you, I will never leave you, and I will always call you back. Because the fear of the Lord, the awesomeness of God, is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Christian friends, that is where we are. We are at that point where we are to be in awe of what God is doing in our lives. And we are seeking that truth because we know when we seek truth, we will find Jesus. For it says in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
I just want to remind people, if you have a prayer request that you want to ensure I get in the uh, pastoral prayer, please send it to me on the Lebanon text prayer. Um, but even if you call me or send me a, a, a text from my phone or an email, I'll, I'll get it in there. Uh, but that would be a wonderful way to do it. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for this church, for all that we're trying to do in this community. Thank you so much for Vacation Bible School that will start this week, later on Summer's Best Two Weeks, for everything that we do that really helps to share and explain who you are to the community and by extension to the world. Thank you for being present with all those that have so much commitment and dedication that they're doing this because this is their way of sharing the gospel. We thank you for them. Lord, we ask your blessings on Kirk Barner, a childhood friend uh, for, of Sue Farringer, who has, who's a pending rupture, has an abscess and pneumonia, who's recovering, hopefully, who's actually left the hospital and has gone down to Virginia to be with uh, his dad, Tom, who also has lung and heart issues. Continue to be with Doreen and the family of Lori Hurst, who passed away, Reg's sister. We thank you that Josh and Joe have traveled 30, uh, 36 hours across the United States and are just about, probably are already in California or at uh, Joshua's new apartment. Let the week they spend together there be wonderful and give Josiah a safe trip back from California to Virginia. We thank you that Bob Hawk's surgery went well for his uh, spinal fusion and, and he thanks us for all the cards and uh, uh, cards he received. We ask your blessings to be with John Federkal over the passing of his brother Richard, the last of his siblings, his younger brother. Give him peace knowing that his brother is where all his other siblings, his mom and dad are, and where all those have preceded him. And that one day, many years from now, he will, he will be with them. Lord, continue to be with Adeline McGuire, Alice Tashwar's granddaughter. With Terry Nicholson, who's, doing, who's continuing to do well. With Bernie Hollis is his back pain. Tom Fox, who um, has a lot of uh, different issues, but his upcoming surgery for aortic stenosis, please be with him as he gets a valve replacement. For Rich Mills and his brother, uh, his brother-in-law Bob Scheider, who's not doing well, with uh, Tony Belinda Eber's friend and uh, teacher, who's continuing to recover. With Mike and Donna, as Mike is recovering really well from his surgery, and Donna is continuing to having positive res results from her infusion, and hopefully her, pain, her knee pain will be relieved soon. With Bob Hawk's fr uh, friend, Larry, who is struggling with uh, leukemia. Lord, be with uh, Debbie and Jim Eber, who uh, continue to support and love uh, Debbie's sister, Jan. With the Costa family, as they recover uh, as Jen, uh, Jen recovers from her surgery, uh, be with Maria down the internship. We thank you so much that the Galeotto uh, men came back from their fishing trip in Canada well. Continue to be with the Wonka family and healing for Patty's foot and with uh, Tommy and Debbie Beckervac. Be with Marcy, uh, Sherry Strawn's friend who is undergoing chemo and not doing well. Be with Amy Hines, Nancy Ritchie's daughter, who's having some tests done, trying to figure out what some uh, issues might be with uh, her granddaughter and Belinda's daughter and uh, Ken's daughter, Katie, who's having uh, shoulder surgery tomorrow. And be with uh, Nancy's grandson, Matthew, who's uh, in his uh, fifth out of six weeks at the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School in Quantico. Let him uh, graduate. He's done real well. Let him graduate and uh, begin that preparation uh, to be commissioned upon his uh, college graduation and then go off to the schools he's going to go to be a Marine officer. Continue to be with Adam and uh, Cassie as they look forward to the uh, joy of their first child, which should happen in about a month or so. Uh, be with his Aunt Vicki, who's still struggling with pancreatic cancer. Continue to be with the Bender family, with uh, Dan, who is holding his own, uh, Amy, who's recovering from her back surgery, and with Lillian, who's recovering from uh, skin grafts. The sores uh, are slowly healing. Be with Jackie Kanak as she has side effects from uh, her chemo. 
Uh, be with all those who are struggling with illness or injury. Be with those who have depression or anxiety, difficult, uh, difficult life decisions in front of them, or private hurts and pain. Give them the hope and assurance that comes when we put our full trust in you. Continue to be with Cameron, who fell through the roof at Century 3 Mall. Uh, Lord, continue to be with our country as we struggle through this political divide. Let us de-escalate rhetoric in, in our homes as well as in publicly. Lord, be with our police and military. Give our uh, country security. And we ask you to be with uh, in Russia as they face a potential civil war, a coup. Uh, Lord, just uh, give them your presence and let sanity reign there. Lord, in all things, we come to you knowing that you love us and knowing that you are with us and that you open our hearts, our minds to your truth, to your understanding, to your son, Jesus Christ. So bless us and keep us at all times as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, our offering baskets are in the back. For those who have uh, given your offerings uh, already, we thank you. And for those who would like to after worship, uh, we would appreciate that as well as YouTube and Zoom. If you'd like to mail your offerings in, that would be great. Because we seek to use these offerings to share the good news with, uh, and to share God's understanding with the world in West Mifflin, Pittsburgh, and wherever we share, wherever we may go. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the gifts you give us. Help us to return that proper portion of our time, talent, financial resources as we in all ways, all times, seek to share the good news that your son Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. So Lord, bless us, keep us, guide us in all things. We ask in your son's holy name. Amen.
Christian friends, as we leave this place today, let us know that we do have ears to hear and eyes to see and heart ready to understand because we have received that from God in Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see, hear, and understand all that God gives us. Have we done so? Are we doing it the best we can? If not, let's start. If we are, let's do even more by sharing the good news with all that come into our lives. For they too need to hear it in order to listen, to see it in order to perceive, and to uh, receive it in order for their hearts to understand so they too through the power of the holy spirit can understand what god in christ is trying to do in their lives let us do that at vacation bible school let us do that in some of his best few weeks let us do that in every part of our lives each and every day and with the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the compassion of god's holy spirit be upon each and every one of us now and always amen mm -hmm.